morning. Just gonna ride a bike, Mark. How are you, man? Very good. Oh, shit, look at this. Woo. Yeah, I got a spread of diabetes. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this beautiful day. Thank you for the incredible, awesome, awesome privilege to do this. Lord, as we support there and everyone else is involved in this, in this adventure, I pray, Lord, that the people that we want to give to support this great idea of the cause that it is for. I pray, Lord, though, you would give, go with us, be with us throughout this entire day. Give us strength. We give you honor. We give you praise for everything that you deserve. Three, two, one. I never do anything without being prepared. I think it comes from fighting background because we would always have fight camps. So in a fight camps, you give yourself six to eight weeks to get ready for the fight. Uh, you make sure all your, you know, your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted, so you got your strength and conditioning. You got your technical work, you got your sparring, you know, you make sure that your nutrition's on point, that your weight's on point. So when I do that, when I do something like this, it's the same thing. It's not normal at all, but for Dan and his family, stuff like this is, is super normal for them. I remember that first year that we were together, like he wanted to do 1500 burpees in a day. And it was the same kind of thing. It was, he was raising a dollar per burpee for the dream dealer. Um, because they were, they were doing this back then when we first met, this must've been nine, nine years ago. He's someone that in through our whole life, he's pushed himself to the limit Dan's always uh, been a big support for the Dream Dealer, and I know it, it you know, my experience through it is uh, also in his heart. One hour for a thousand bucks. <laughs> First hour, he's got to do the other bike. One thousand bucks. Nice. Oh man, do I warm up for something? This is a long time. <laughs> and uh, ultimately, together as brothers, we share a vision of helping others in whatever way we can do that. I got some more. I want to try to hit 500 cows. Nice, yeah. nice. That's a good walk. I, I wouldn't last on that bike for probably over an hour or so. To see him set such a high goal, to get others involved, to be asking these questions and to, to be interested in what we're doing. and uh, It's great. I'm excited for the, the big day for Dan and also feel a little bit bad for him. <laughs> Being with a numb wiener is not fun. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> My brother runs a charity uh, for 100 kids in Haiti and uh, I had just reached out to him to see how things were going and he told me it's tough because he funds everything himself and there's not a lot of money coming in from uh, the events that he's been doing. 100% of what is given to Dream Dealer goes directly to those projects and our cause. I work a full-time job outside of it. I work 67 hour weeks. Um, and I try to provide on top of uh, whoever is giving for that year with what we can from the company. So there's no administrative cost. There's nothing like that at all. We want to be as effective as we can with any dollar given to, to the Dream Dealer. You know, as a father of three kids and knowing that there's a hundred kids out there who are uh, struggling for survival, never mind uh, having any opportunity in life, um, I just felt in my heart that it was something that I needed to do. So, so what I did was I told my members that I would do one calorie on the Echo Bike, which is a conditioning tool we use with the fighters. I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that I can make people want to quit less than 60 seconds on that bike, and I'm planning on doing this for 12 hours straight. One calorie for every dollar raised, and I'll do it over a 12-hour period, and we got up to $7,000. You move in your hands all over this thing in different positions as you go, and your feet. They stay in the same place for too long, things start to really hurt. You start to get really tired, I start to sink. Really? So I hope you're ready for that, yeah. <laughs> I can't help myself, it helps me deal with pain. Oh my God. You know, my brain works in maybe a little bit of a weird way compared to other people. I guess I could have gone out there and done, you know, another charity golf tournament or something like that, but I felt like I needed to suffer on some type of level of what these kids are facing. Not that what I'm gonna do is as hard as the life they live, but it's still gonna be a point of being super uncomfortable and making sure that I am uh, in a place that I've never been before, that I have to struggle through to get through um, to make it happen. So when he says he has this idea, like it's not normal, but to me it's not surprising. It's just, 
it's just what they do. It's just how they roll. So it's something that I've come to expect and, and it's just part of our lives, this type of over the top um, gestures, but for the sake of giving. Hello everybody in Canada. My name is Larry Mies, the, the leader of the Dream Zero in Haiti. I've been working on behalf of the Dream Zero since 2010. So I want to thank you for supporting our mission here in Haiti. Um, we are working hard to support the children in Haiti. So without you, this would not be possible. I want to say thank you to you for this. And I want you to know, with your help, we have been doing great things in Haiti. We support the kids. We provide them education, food, clothes, everything that they need, we provide them. So we say thank you for supporting our mission here in Haiti. Without you, this would not be possible. Thank you. You know what, it was kind of from a shaken up part of our lives where our family went through a rough time. We lost, um, we lost kind of everything we had at the time. So. We were, we were dealing with really real situations of our vehicles getting repoed. Uh, we eventually lost our home. And it put in perspective to me uh, the little importance of material things in this world. And it, uh, there was a major shift in my heart at that time. In 2010, we were living together and that's when the hurricane in Haiti, that first big one happened. And I remember he saw it and he, he came to me and he's like, I need to go and I need to do something. So he had contacted uh, one of the, those relief uh, groups and set up for himself to go down there and do a mission down there and help rebuild um, orphanages and houses and stuff like that. I remember that day telling me that and I kind of had a feeling of like, man, this is like super dangerous. This, you know, this is my best friend. There was a moment in Haiti that a child brought me to his house. And so I went there just after uh, the earthquake in 2010 and his house had literally cracked in half on itself. And he brought me in and his family was in the house and it was just a small square. And I could see all of the food they had. Um, I could see everything they, they owned. And the grandmother started to cook me a meal. And I could see that it was the last of their food. And they sat me down at their table, which is right direct in the middle of their home, and uh, offered me this meal. And I was trying to refuse, but they insisted that I eat this meal. And I took, I took a bite, and that whole family cheered me on and were, were just instantly filled with joy. And that moment, um, it took some time to process what was happening there, but when I reflect back at the time, that was the poorest family I had met in my life with a house that was cracked in half and fed me the last of their food and cheered for me as I ate it. And when he came back, he was so changed. He uh, I think one of the first things he said to me is he's like, I'm going to sell everything I have so I can send the money down there to help these kids. And he was like selling his bed and like sleeping on the ground. It was, it was, like he was so changed, it was so different. It became just very clear to me that I needed to shift my lifestyle and that I had to do something for these people. And even now, like I, I haven't spoken about that in a while, but it's, it's emotional to me because it's such an impactful uh, time and moment in my life uh, that just shifted me to really uh, try to have a lasting impact somehow, some way. I felt like this is what I've been called to do and I need to do it. Our family just lost everything. So we didn't have money. I didn't have parents that could give me money to go on a trip. So I needed to sell what I could to, to be able to go to Haiti. Stuff like this is is super normal for them. When I first met Dan and his family, I would hear stories about Mike going to Haiti. I would hear stories about even before that, when they were kids growing up, the people that his dad would help, the people that they would welcome into their home, and the people that they would care for as if they were family. Things that are not normal to most people, just 
just are normal to them. Things like, things like giving. For both of us, our faith has been really uh, something that's grounded us and kept us close uh, since we were kids. And he just said that like he felt God wanted him to, to do this. And so that's kind of where the Dream Dealer started, is that he wanted a way to be able to continue to help the kids down there and, and the people there. And it went from uh, that to him running charity uh, golf tournaments and raising money and helping a couple kids to more kids to buying a house down there. Now there's like over 100 kids that are uh, fed and schooled. My goal always is to try to provide them the knowledge uh, the resources to make themselves sufficient. I want them to be able to provide for themselves. I want them to see a future for themselves and we want to lend that helping hand. Starting from the children, and providing them with knowledge, getting them into school, paying for their school supplies. And the parents that are at home, we hired tradesmen, teachers. The goal is just to continue to help as many people as possible in the most effective way that we, we can think of. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I, feel, I feel the energy of everybody around, which is nice. So I just went live on the Savon podcast for a second there. He's got a really big podcast in the CrossFit world. So I was on there to talk about the ride, and then now he just had me pop on and tell everybody what I was doing again. So that's cool. From a young age, I've always enjoyed uh, challenging myself, but I've never felt like I'm getting where I. I need to go without kind of pushing the boundaries of what I was capable of. You know, I've competed in CrossFit, I've done powerlifting meets, I've done Olympic weightlifting meets, but I've never done something that would push me mentally to the point of like where I don't know if I'm going to make it or if I'm going to break mentally, if I'm going to break physically. For me, I think the most important part of the day is going to be when the kids get down for a nap coming and being here in that middle of the day when there's not going to be a lot going on, there's not going to be a lot of food stations. I know that's when Dan is going to start to have a hard time. When he passes that six hour mark is going to be uncharted territory. He's never done more than six hours. So that's, you know, that's what's going to be hard for him. So that's when I want to just be here for him and be like, hey, it's just you and me. Let's just get it done. I've noticed that the rides where I feel really good, I'm only like, I'm only ever 15 minutes ahead of myself. So I'm only thinking, okay, in 15 minutes from now, I'm gonna have this drink. And then I just go back off into La La Land, like this, hit those increments, hit those increments. When you start thinking like, oh, I did an hour, I gotta do this, you know, six more times today, it can get very daunting. So we're gonna have another one of these set up so people can sign in to ride with me for a half an hour, an hour, and keep me company. <laughs> That's when you're really gonna have to dig deep and think about, okay, this is why we're here. This is why we're doing this. That's, yeah. Woo! Woo! Awesome. Oh, yeah. 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 My six-year-old, he told his grandparents that he didn't want me to ride alone for 12 hours. They found a little like stationary bike that was big enough for him. And now he gets on that thing with me in the garage and he'll ride for half an hour at a time because he sees what daddy's doing and he wants to do it too. And that will take me, that takes me to a whole different level. I could ride the bike all day just thinking about him and what change I have on his little mind and his body. This is something that uh, is in all of our hearts. Uh, it's not just me that went through that time. It's, it's our entire family. And so we draw from that experience and we're thankful that we share a perspective on life now that's much different than it would have been. There's these barriers that in your mind that you can break through as you push yourself further into places you've never been. And I'm like consistently breaking through these barriers. I can go two hours, I can go three hours, I can go four hours. What happens at five hours? And mentally, can I keep telling myself that I can keep going?
That's why we do anything in life. That's why we set goals. That's why we do competitions because there's a finish line where you can say like, look at what I did. And then all of your friends and family are there at that finish line with you. We all set limitations to ourselves and when we break through those limitations we realize like oh if i can do this i can do that as long as i'm committed to the process i don't think there's anything special about me it's about accepting in your mind that you are capable of way more than you give yourself credit for and you just need to take yourself deeper and deeper and deeper every time and if i can portray that and i can show people that way then i think i've won on so many levels they see Dan crossing the finish line and being there with him, then they'll know that there could be something like that in their lives that they could do too. It's just about setting some sort of goal for something in your life and working on it, having that consistency and that dedication. I think in life, you fall into patterns. It's hard on a day-to-day -day basis for so many people uh, in different ways. But I think what I'd always want to encourage, you wake up every day thankful to continue to work for others, to serve others with joy, with happiness. did it. You did it. 12 hours later, we did it. <laughs> 7,011 calories. Dream Dealer becomes more than just an organization. It becomes a way of living, I think. And that's what, um, I think that's what everyone can take away from the Dream Dealer is a change of heart and to, to implement a uh, new perspective on life. And that's what, uh, that would be the ultimate goal, just to to be able to have a, to be an inspiration to others throughout the world. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs>